Hi, I'm Gavin Harrison, and welcome to my episode of Vic Firth's Stories Behind the Sleeves. So I've had a lot of questions about the design of my signature stick and uh, I thought what would be interesting is to show you a little history of how I arrived with that size of stick, that shape of stick and I'll take you on a little um, a, a sort of a trip down memory lane for me. My local music store in the late 70s, early 80s was called Hammonds. I'm out in the suburbs of London. And they had a company make sticks for them. They, were, they used to call them Hammond's Hammers. This is what they called C. And these are really tiny sticks. I mean, these are like knitting needles to me now. But, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, I was playing mostly jazz kind of music and playing in my dad's jazz group. So it felt appropriate. And it was all going well until I started playing more rock-orientated music and um, these just were not happening. Um, in, the, in the early 80s, I did my first tour of the United States and um, I went into a music store in Manhattan, probably Manny's, I would think, and I found these beautiful Vic Firth sticks. These were called SD1. And they're quite, uh, they're quite thick sticks, but they're not heavy because they're made of maple. And I really love these sticks. These, I, I could play at the sort of volumes that I wanted to play at and everything was going great. SD1, uh, it was a miracle to me. Now, when I got back to England, uh, 1986, uh, I started to play with Iggy Pop. And that was, uh, you know, loud, loud punk music. I was rim shot in the snare drum and the SD1s being maple were just exploding and uh, were no use to me anymore. The rehearsal room that we were at was called John Henry's and they made, well, they had them made. They're just a sort of generic stick maker, made the sticks for them. And these were called Super Soul and they're hickory. And so I thought that was a, a, a fantastic way forward, you know, playing with Iggy Pop, playing really loud, really, really loud. These were good but actually in retrospect they feel pretty horrible as a from a balance point of view uh, a few years later uh, and when i started playing with uh, porcupine tree i found the vic firth rock model and these felt so much nicer than the super soul models that i'd been playing before and for the first time ever i started to think wow this is what a balanced stick feels like this is really nice. Um, by the start of the last tour of Porcupine Tree, about 2009, they brought out Vic Grip, which was the red um, sort of rubberized dip, I think it was. And it was in red because it matched, you know, the Vic Firth red parts of the stick and the logo. And that was fantastic. I felt like that really made playing the drums for two and a half hours in some very loud situations that made the whole thing so much nicer. So uh, wind forward to about 2010, 2011 and the Vic Firth team invited me to uh, design my own stick. Now they'd sent me quite a few other sticks, some other um, artist signature sticks. One of them was the Aaron Spear stick and although it was much smaller and thinner than I was looking for, it had a very interesting uh, tip. So I said to the Vic Firth team, okay, can you make me a pair of sticks which are rock model, a bit longer with the Aaron Spears tip? And this is what they sent me. And these are virtually unplayable. <laughs> 
I then realised, and I wrote to them and said, OK, I've now realised that designing a stick is not as easy as I thought. I built, well, I requested a Frankenstein's monster, actually. Now, following, um, following that experiment, uh, the Vic Firth team got involved and really started helping me make a balanced stick. And I said, oh, by the way, it's got to have the grip on it. Do you only do the grip in red? And they said, no, we can do the whatever colour you want. What colour do you want? So I said, well, Sonar have just built me this new kit in a sort of dark navy blue. Could you make a stick that's, that's got the Vic grip in that colour? And they said, sure. And that was the start. That was the um, Shar 1, S-H-A-R 1 stick. And that had the, um, the Vic grip on it. However, there was some issues with the Vic grip, uh, especially in very hot temperatures. So they withdrew it after maybe, I don't know, two years or something. And then they gave me um, a new model, which was the same, the same stick, but in the light blue Vic grip. And I found that to be too aggressive for me. So we then moved to what we call SHAR2, SHAR2 which is this stick. This is like a matte, it's like a matte paint finish and it feels a bit more like a stick that's got no varnish on it. Um, and of course they could do it in the dark blue again that I'd established from the first stick. Now what I really like to do is use, when I'm in certain playing conditions, I like to use wax on the stick and it's a sort of surfboard wax. Um, and I just rub it on like this. And I can put on as much as I like to get the feel that I want. Because some days I want, might want more grit than others. Um, this is called Dr. Zog's Sex Wax. Yep, which is fine until you get stopped by a customs officer. And he opens up your suitcase and says, oh yeah, what's this then? <laughs> Uh, it's a long story. So, and recently I've started on the Zildjian uh, medium wax that does a very similar job to the Dr. Zog one. And that just gives me just like the perfect grip to me. I mean, everyone's different. They like it, you know, and I would reapply that during, uh, during a concert. I might reapply it two or three times in between songs until I've got just the right amount of grip. Um, the stick is uh, 428 centimetres by 420, 428 millimetres by 16 millimetres. I'm sure some people feel like it's 428 centimetres, which in imperial measurement is 16 and 7 eighths. So it's just a tiny bit short of 17 inches and 0 0.630 of an inch. So they are really big sticks. But I found that for the dynamic range that I use, it gives me a lot of, a lot of uh, headroom because sometimes I, I like to play really, really loud. And sometimes the music kind of requires that. I can't play heavy rock metal songs like this. You know, I need to really hit the drums and hit the cymbals and it feels right to me. The dynamic range you're going to get with a tiny stick, um, like this one, okay, you'll be able to play whisper quiet ghost notes, but the playing really loud with a small stick, you're only going to get to, let's say, this volume level, and, but you'll be able to do really quiet ghost notes. With a massive stick like this, okay, I won't be able to play the same uh, quiet, whisper quiet ghost notes, but... I actually don't need to play that quiet. In the dynamic range that I like to play in, the ghost notes are never that quiet. They, when you, once you've got electric guitars and distorted guitars and bass and synths and all sorts of things, the ghost notes get pretty lost in rock music. So I don't need to play the ghost notes whisper quiet, but the advantage is I've got extra room at the top of the dynamic range to really hit the drums hard. So um, lots of people 
often ask me what sort of exercises do I do before the show starts, warm-up exercises, backstage, 20, 30 minutes before we go on stage. There's two basic things I do. One is to really get the muscles moving in your arms, is to play double stroke roll until it just starts to hurt and then switch to playing singles. That kind of thing, maybe five or ten minutes, you know, just to really get the muscles activated and, uh, and warmed up. The other thing I do quite a lot is uh, like a unison exercise. I think of it as a, as a calibration exercise, and that is to play both sticks at exactly the same time on the pad, like this. Some of it I do, you know, in French grip. Some in German grip and some, some in the middle. You can do, I mean, or if you play traditional grip, whatever. But it's the sound that I know, it's the way I can check that the message coming from my brain and going down the right side and the message from my brain coming down the left side it, and they're arriving together. Funny thing is, when I start doing it, normally it's a little bit rough. After 5, 10, 20 minutes, I can really get that phasing sound, the sound where they're both hitting together. And probably the easiest way for me to explain or show you how the phasing sound, you know, what it really sounds like, is I'll start by playing really wide flams. A flam, of course, is when you play two notes almost together, and then I'll close the flam so the sticks will get closer and closer and closer in time until they land on top of each other. And that, at that moment, you'll hear the sound change. It will become this sort of phasing sound. <clears throat> when they get really close, they start to sound like... I'll show you what I mean. Did you hear that phasing sound right in the middle there? Now that's a sound that I know I'm calibrated. I know that I'm intending the sticks to hit together at the same time, and they actually are. So I try to think of exercises that um, include that sound, times where the sticks are actually hitting at the same time. So any of those basic flam exercises that you might know, flam paradiddles and uh, flam triplets and uh, Swiss army triplets, all those kind of things, just try to flatten out the, the flam to the point where you reach that um, phasing sound. And 20 minutes later, I'm ready to go on stage. No.
like you've given it You fight like you've given it We're uncovering your shrine Now, I get a lot of questions about tuning. Uh, people who'd like to know my tuning method, I'm going to explain that for you now. Sometimes people ask me, um, how do I know when to change the head? Well, it's kind of, uh, it's a bit like saying, how, how long's a piece of string? Some heads I've had on for more than a year. Sometimes I've only had a head on for a day until it feels instinctively bad. I think you just think, oh, I can feel something's wrong with that head. When you take all the bolts down, if the drum head you take off has got a big crater in the middle, I would say that's time to uh, change the head. So I've loosened all the bolts. This is a 12 by 9 drum. And one thing I like to do is try to remember where the bolts came from. So I quite often just uh, put the new head in and then put the bolts back so they go back into the lug from which they came because you want to keep that relationship of the same bolt in the same lug. Some of the uh, tuning methods that I use and I'm sure some of you do too is to feel the amount of torque the amount of um, resistance in the bolts. Um, I think I actually once had a, a, a device, a sort of big black device that would measure the amount of torque on each lug. So I'll put the screws in. Okay, now I always use two keys. It's important to me that the head gets pulled onto the drum at exactly the same amount of pressure each side. So I'm going to tighten the, the bolts down to almost touching the rim. There we go. Now, there's no tension on any of the bolts yet. And what I want to do is try to match evenly. So as soon as I start to feel resistance on this side, I get to the same amount of resistance that side. This is a kind of feel thing. So it, it, it's subject to um, the amount of strength I've got in my fingers. And, you know, tuning the drums is, a, is quite a black art. You just, it's a thing that you just spend your whole life learning about. And this is the way I do it. So I wait till I feel the slightest bit of resistance and it feels matched with the opposite side. Then I go to two other lugs and do the same thing. Okay, and then the same on this one. Then go back to the original ones and just apply a bit more pressure. I'm feeling the torque uh, in the keys, all right? Now we're getting close to as far as I can go with my fingers. You can hear the drum's already got some tension in it. At this point, I would really put a lot of pressure on the top of the drum. You know, you need to stretch the heads. It's a bit like a guitar string. You can't just put a guitar string on and tune it up following a tuner. The first few times you hit it, the pitch will go way down. And the same thing here. 
Sometimes when you push in the middle, you can see some wrinkles appearing. Sometimes you actually feel them. Um, and that shows you that there's less tension on this particular skin at this area because there's some wrinkles. Kind of easier to do with a clear head actually because you can see the reflection in the light. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and apply like a little, I don't know, what's that, about a third of a turn. And I'm looking for the lowest point at the time, uh, any given point. I always tune up, I, I never tune down. Now something interesting to know is that, um, you know, the area around each lug is not discrete. If I hear this one is a bit low, well, listen to this. It's sending the pitch up or down right across the head, even when you just turn one bolt. So it's probably impossible to get every single lug exactly the same pitch. There are various devices, apps, tune bots, things like that that you can follow. There are um, things that measure tympanic pressure, tension watch, drum dial, all those things. I think some of them work better on a brand new head because you know it's, it's kind of untouched. Once you've beaten the head a few times, you might end up with a head like that. Well, all those calculations about torque or tympanic pressure, all those are gonna go out the window, for, for my, in my opinion, because the head is not exactly straight anymore. It's got craters in it, and the crater won't be exactly in the middle. If you can, uh, I mean, on the, on the bottom head, as I said, I've got a, a clear ambassador, and never be tempted to play that with a stick because you will, you will really mess up the chance of this acting like a, you know, a clean, uh, vibrating uh, membrane. <laughs> um, this is what happens when you, uh, you know, you've hit a bottom head a lot of times. It will be full of craters and they won't be exactly in the center. So the head is actually, uh, you know, it's got more surface area now that it's got a crater in it and you're gonna have a lot of trouble. So you can use reference. Sometimes I use the piano. I'll, you know, to hear the pitch, you need to put the drum on your legs or on a towel. Still needs tuning up a little bit. Um, and you can, you can reference a piano or you can reference a, a, a tuner. Sometimes like on my, um, on my phone, I've got a series of recordings, which are me tapping the top heads of all the toms and the bottom heads of all the toms. So in case I'm in, you know, Timbuktu doing a drum clinic with a brand new drum set, it's nice to have at least a rough reference of where my drums normally sit in the overall picture. If I'm gonna change one drum, then, uh, you know, like a sound check or something, I'll just take that drum off, change it and put it back. And then I've got the reference of the other drums to tell me if it's in the right zone or not. I always have the bottom head higher than the top head. It's normally um, a tone or a minor third or a major third uh, if you're you know, referencing a piano or something, that's the kind of difference, but it's not exact. I don't go exactly, I don't tune it up so it's perfectly in tune with the piano. I don't think of the drums as being exactly in tune, uh, you know, with, with the rest of the instruments in the band, but I do like certain intervals. So I'll put this drum back in the set and then we'll see how it compares to the other toms. Okay, that's tom three back in place and, um, now I can check its relative pitch against the other toms. Okay, sounds about right to me. 
If I can play this melody, then I know I'm in the right ballpark. Um, the snare drum, I try to pitch the snare drum somewhere between the first two toms. The snare drum is the only drum I would consider changing its pitch because of the song. In a, in a recording situation, I might think I want to tune this up or down because of the song, or maybe use a different size drum. Um, it's the rest of the drums, the toms, the bass drum, I, they just stay the same, whatever the style of music or whatever the session is. Um, the way that I hit the snare drum, I grip the left stick with my little finger and that controls the amount of vibration in the stick. And um, as I hit quite hard backbeats with a, with a rim shot, and I'm trying to be uh, consistent in the way that I hit the drum, you know, in pop, rock, prog music, you want a really solid backbeat and the same sound. I tend to get the tip of the stick slightly north of the centre and that gives me the, the backbeat sound that, sound that I'm looking for. I also play the ghost notes uh, still with the stick um, trapped or held by the little finger. So I do the ghost notes with my wrist. They're usually the two sounds I really need is a good strong backbeat and a good ghost note sound. Um, so now let's go over to the computer and see how the drums sound inside the mixing environment. Okay, now let's hear what the drums sound like once they've been recorded. I did a little recording earlier on and we can hear what all 15 mics sound like together. Now, I can solo um, some of the microphones and hear what they sound like. There's two microphones inside the bass drum. The first one I'm going to play you is the AKG D12 VR. So that's got a nice thump to it. The other microphone inside the bass drum is the Shure Beta 91A. That's a bit more clicky, and I blend the two together. So I can, you know, depending on the mix or what I want from the bass drum in context with the other instruments, I can have more of the thump, more of the click, uh, that kind of thing. Now, this is the top mic on the snare drum, at the top, the top of the snare drum, this is um, an Earthworks SR20. Now this has a compressor plug-in, an SOR8, and uh, I'll play you it without the compressor. Quite a different vibe. Now, because of this second knob here, the attack, because the attack is not set to zero, it's not affecting the initial transient, the initial um, attack of the snare drum, but it's affecting what happens after the attack. So it's bringing up the ghost notes and it's bringing out the tone of the drum. Um, it's giving it a lot of energy 
it's kind of sounding a bit more like I'm hitting it harder than I really am. Let's turn the compressor back on. There we are. Now, um, a big part of any drum sound is the overheads. This is what the overheads sound like. That's almost a mix in itself. And um, I have the overheads up kind of back here somewhere, past my head, like an extension of my ears in a way. And, you know, having had a studio here for a long time, I've had plenty of time to experiment with mic positions. And uh, that's what I felt represented more the way that I heard the drums. When I had the overheads up over the drums pointing at the cymbals, well, it was just a lot of cymbals and not much drums. So they're back here so I can get a more balanced sound from the drum kit. A big part of my sound in this studio is the, uh, the big hall that I have just um, over there outside of this control room. There's this big hall and I've got these big sliding doors. I have them wide open and I have a pair of AKG 414 microphones and they are capturing the sound of the big room and this is what it sounds like. Now again, I've got a compressor. I've got an uh, I've got the S O R eight compressor on that, and if I wanted to go a bit more crazy, I could open up a compressor like this. This is um, a software version of uh, a fantastic piece of hardware that's called Distressor. This is the company who made Distressor. This is their software version of it, and of course, I've you know messed around with all the the knobs and buttons created my own settings. Uh, this one happens to be called Gav Nutter 1. Let's see what this sounds like. Now, if I was going to use that kind of sound on a song, I'd probably make the decision uh, very early on that I was going to go for that, that kind of sound. And if you're going to crush the room in a compressor that much, it can make the cymbals get a bit crazy. So uh, when I've used that sound on certain recordings, quite often I've taken the crash cymbals off the drum set and then recorded them, overdubbed them later on because the cymbals just get too much if you go for a, a really big compression um, on that room. Now, if I close the big room, um, this is what the drums, oh, there's a bit of reverb on the toms. Let's close the reverb on the toms. Uh, this is what the uh, dry drums in this room sound like. And, um, you know, that's, Perfectly good sound. I, there's been times where I've used that in certain parts of the song, and then, like, you know, we did it quite a few times in Porcupine Tree. We'd get to the chorus, and I'd open up the big room with the Gav Nutter setting, <laughs> and it would really explode. You know, the dynamic difference and the, the amount of aggression, perceived aggression, would really come up a lot. Now, of course, in today's world, you know, we're working more and more remotely. Uh, it is quite a, um, an interesting path for, for drummers to have their own studio at home. I would say, you know, 98% of the sessions I've done in the last five years have all been at home. They've all been at home. Once people know you've got a studio at home and you've got a good sound, um, they'll come knocking. Uh, so you might be in a position where you've, you've you're thinking about having a, a, a recording facility at home. You don't necessarily need the world's most expensive microphones or the world's most expensive mic preamps. You can get a good sound from the drums, you know, without having a big hall necessarily. Uh, 
the digital reverbs are very good and um, you know you can set up a good thing at home maybe you're playing in a in a room in the house a bedroom or spare bedroom or something or the garage or the shed at the bottom of the garden um, I think if I was gonna spend money on anything I would spend money on acoustic treatment because you know the drums are a very acoustic instrument and they really rely heavily or, or can sound good in certain rooms so you want to make sure that the room they're in is not having an adverse effect on the sound of the drums if you've got a room with parallel walls you've got to be careful of what they call standing wave if you stand in the middle of the room and clap your hands you might hear a sort of pinging sound coming off the walls like a riff, like a, a, a bad reverb that's the sort of thing you want to get rid of and acoustic panels acoustic treatment can really help the drums I know from taking this kit from different room uh, you know in different studios and different venues same drums same tuning the drums can really sound very different um, I think of the drums as just one instrument I you know they ring the drums are ringing you can hear if I just solo the toms here you will hear the bass drum and the snare drum and the hi-hat and every in just the tom mics And that's fine by me. I actually like that sound. I like the drums ringing all the time. That's the sound of a drum kit. It's like a grand piano. You play one note on a grand piano, all the strings ring. I don't think of the grand piano as 88 separate instruments, you know, a discrete instrument for each string, because they ring all the time. Uh, some, some people have a philosophy about trying to clean everything up and close everything down. Uh, that's certainly not the way I go. If I could advise uh, anyone interested in getting into it, engineering and mixing a little bit, there's four things I think you should uh, either go on a course to learn or you, at minimum you will be able to find videos on YouTube of people talking about it. The first one is gain structure, how much, um, how you affect the volume of the microphone going into the computer, uh, phase, because this, uh, this rec what I'm doing here, there's 15 mics all hearing all of the drums all the time. And the phase can create bad sounds and make some things sound worse and some things sound better. So you need to understand how phase works. Uh, EQ is very important. And uh, I only try to EQ the drums in context of the music. Soloing drums to EQ them is almost pointless because when you take it out of solo and all the, the music comes in, all the bass synths and uh, the bottom end of the piano, uh, detuned guitars, it will be meaningless because you could EQ something, bring in all the other instruments and then what all the work you've done will just disappear. So I like to EQ in context. The other thing I think you should learn is compression. Um, of course, reverb always helps drums, but that's more of a, you know, the things that you send to the reverb. I send uh, uh, to, the, to the reverb bus just the toms and the snare top if I'm not using my large hall as part of my, uh, you know, reverb sound. If I was doing a dead dry drum mix, I would put a little bit of reverb on the toms and the snare. I wouldn't put it on the overheads or the ride cymbal or even the bass drum really. So the rest of it is balance. Once you've got your head around those four ideas of uh, gain structure, phase, EQ and compression, the rest of it is just about balancing. How loud should I have the bass drum? How loud should I have the snare drum? How loud should I have the hi-hat? If things are too loud in the overall mix, and you'll be able to tell that from the um, from the overheads. If the bell of the ride is too loud, well, you're better off doing it again and remembering to play the bell a bit quieter. Or get a cymbal that doesn't have such a loud bell. If you've got like 17 inch hi-hats and you're really hitting them very hard, they'll be all over every mic and it'll be very hard to turn that down. That will be really dominant in your mix. So you need to play your mix 
the ideal mix. If the overheads doesn't sound like a mix, then it's probably down to the way that you played. Um, I hope this little insight into the way that I mix has been useful to you, and I hope you have chance to record your own drums and mess around uh, trying to mix them. Yes, I knew this all along. I hurt you. Cause I got demons. Cause I got demons. So this is the fabulous big room where I capture all the amazing reverb, the ambience of this room on these two mics with the drum set in there in the control room 
and um, it really gives the drum sound a, a, a big character. So I'd like to thank you for watching my episode of Vic Firth's Stories Behind the Sleeves. <laughs>